a lot of people have the idea that, let's say 30, 40, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 70 years ago, the United States led the world academically and we've slipped from that lofty perch down to where we are today, which is pretty mediocre. Uh, on PISA, for example, we score around the middle of the pack. Um, we never led the world, ever. This is At Brookings, a weekly in-depth look at issues behind the news. This week, can an American education compete globally? How do American teenagers stack up against their global counterparts in academic achievement? According to the latest PISA, or Program for International Student Assessment Rankings, the U.S. is solidly mediocre. 65 countries took the test, and though the U.S. saw its rankings improve, 34 countries scored better in math, 42 outpaced the U.S. in science, and 48 in reading. Senior fellow Tom Loveless examines the findings in a Brown Center report and says the rankings are not surprising, nor do they portend bad times ahead. PISA measures reading literacy, uh, mathematics literacy, and science literacy. The U.S. did not place at the top of the heap. Singapore, China, South Korea, those were the leading countries. Why did the U.S. do so poorly? We have a very diverse population. We have a large number of students who do not speak, for instance, uh, English as their native language. So they have to learn English when they come to the United States. Um, we also have uh, uh, one of the, among the uh, advanced countries economically, we have a large population of children in poverty, and we know that poverty affects uh, test scores. So the United States is a huge country. It's quite heterogeneous, more heterogeneous than, say, Finland, which is another country, very small country that scores well on PISA. And um, so the U.S. does struggle with, uh, with these international tests. Also, our school system, frankly, just isn't that good, um, and it never has been very good. My own explanation for the mediocre performance of American students over the decades has been that the American culture, if you compare the American culture and its emphasis, how much it emphasizes learning, it's not as much as the countries that score very high at the top. Well, if it's a classroom culture mix, how important is it what the child is exposed to at home, that part of his culture? It's actually less classroom and more cultural emphasis on learning, which I mentioned, which the way culture is transmitted to children is initially through their parents and how their parents uh, raise them. What's, what's the value of achievement within the home? Now, I'll give you an example, for, exa for instance. Um, as I said, the PISA, PISA test is done with 15-year-olds. In the United States, we have three activities, and study after study, we've seen that three activities dominate 15-year-olds uh, or teenagers' time. And we're, the United States is quite unique in this regard. One is part-time jobs. In the rest of the world, kids don't have part-time jobs. They don't work at all because the parents feel that the kids have a job and it's to go to school and do very well. Uh, the second thing, which is, by the way, the activity that dominates uh, teens out of school life more than any other, is hanging out with friends. Americans are extremely social, and our teenagers spend more time hanging out with their friends than almost any other country in the world, too. And then the third is extracurricular activities and sports. So when you take those three things and you carve off, carve out all of the time that isn't spent at school, and you say, here are the three things these kids are going to be doing, and none of them have anything to do with academics, then uh, that pays a, that pays a, we pay a price for that in terms of academic achievement. Tom, there's at least one study that shows that a country's GDP is higher if its students do better on the PISA test. Is this a fair connection to make? Looked at all international test scores over several decades, and the prediction was made that a 25-point increase in PISA would in increase our GDP by $40 trillion or more. Um, the, the point is that economic vitality is one of the benefits of education. It's not the only benefit. You don't, you don't have to just be materialistic in order to support education. After all, over the last uh, 2,000 years, the people who have supported education tend to be humanists, not uh, gross materialists, uh, that there's a value in people being learned. The Greeks, for example, argued this all the time. There's a value in being learned, and it's not, it extends beyond simply increasing one's material well-being. 
Well, what are the benefits of a better academic background? If you take two people of virtually um, the same level, <clears throat> the same level of socioeconomic background, same level of sort of native intelligence that they're born with, if one has more education than the other, there, there are tremendous economic payoffs to that through a lifetime. And there are payoffs that even extend beyond uh, financial benefits. Um, also, just a higher quality of life. So when we take, we, we actually have longitudinal test scores looking at scores of, say, math scores of teenagers and looked at what, what do they look like, what do those kids look like when they're adults 20, 30, 40 years later. Turns out they have lower levels of things like alcoholism. Um, they're just happier in their lives. They have lower levels of things like criminality, lower levels of even divorce. So um, it's, the, having an education, it doesn't inoculate you against the troubles of the world, but it, it maximizes your chances to have a, a better quality of life later. Stay up to date with the latest research, learn about Brookings events, and search our directory of experts, all from your mobile device. To download Brookings for your BlackBerry, Android, iPhone, or iPad, go to brookings.edu mobile.